Hi again, this is Dave Baronic, call sign Bio. I was an F-14 Rio and I've got about 2,500 flight hours in the F-14 Tomcat and about 650 traps. I did three squadron tours and a tour as a Top Gun instructor in the mid 1980s. I'll be one of your hosts today. Hey, and I'm Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch. I flew the F-14s from 1995 all the way to the end in about 2006. I, I also have about 2,500 flight hours and 650 traps, and I too was a Top Gun instructor pilot. Today, we're gonna to be talking to a couple of gentlemen who were there in the early days of the F-14 program. Uh, it's welcome to episode two of the F-14 Tomcast. Our uh, pilot is uh, Marty Chanick, call sign Streak, and uh, our Rio is Brad Poltler, call sign Lure. They were in VF-1 on the second cruise back in 1976-77, back in the Tomcat's earliest days. Uh, Streak stuck around and uh, retired as a uh, vice admiral. Lur, I think you retired as a uh, commander, captain? Uh, yeah, as 06 of Third Fleet as ACOS. All right. Lur was a, uh, a captain. Nice. So uh, to get started, Streak, please tell us uh, where you're from and how you got into the F-14. Okay, good. Well, thanks, guys. It'll be fun to talk about and chat about the turkey of uh, our days of old, and they are days of old. Uh, but yeah, my background, uh, you know, originally from Tucson, Arizona, went to uh, Naval Academy, graduated from there in June of 73, so that makes me old. Uh, we were fortunate in that we, uh, our class was one of the first classes and go direct to, the, uh, to aviation instead of having to go out to sea for six months. So I went down to Pensacola, got there in early July of 73, uh, ended up uh, getting my wings in August of 74, so about 13 months to get through training command, uh, and was very fortunate to get uh, orders to uh, VF-124, the F-14 RAG. Uh, so kind of the, uh, you know, at that time frame, they started taking nuggets into the program. Uh, so got to Miramar in uh, September 74, and uh, started flying the turkey on the 2nd of January, 75, uh, and got out of the, uh, finished the rag in July and reported to VF-1 in July, about a month or so after they got back from the first cruise of the F-14, VF-1 and VF-2, and they got back, I think, in early July or late June of uh, uh, 75. So that's that's how I got into the uh, turkey. Over to Lur, I guess. Okay. Okay, Lur, right, tell yeah. us where you're from. Yep. A uh, little, little bit of different start, but uh, hooked up with Streak there in the middle. Uh, I grew up in a little town in Iowa, Nichols, Iowa, population 500 people, and uh, went to a little college uh, called Cornell College, not university, in Mount Vernon. Uh, got out of there, and uh, my both my folks were uh, Navy, so I said, well, let me give this thing a try. Went and took the aviation test in Des Moines. Did pretty good, and they asked me if I wanted to go to Pensacola, and I said, sure, why not? Uh, head on down to there, VT-10, uh, then went to VT-86 as an NFO, uh, picked, uh, I'm sorry, VT-10, I got fighters out of there, then VT-86, and my timing was pretty darn good coming out of the 86 because uh, the, the if fiscal year had just changed. The week prior, there were no F-14 seats at all. They were just going F-4 east and west, but when I got in there, there was one F-14 seat, so I sort of lucked out and, and uh, on my last hop and did pretty good, and and off I was, a uh, farm boy from Iowa heading to Miramar, California. Uh, started the uh, rag the same time Streak did. Uh, it was kind of fun. We were all a big group in a class there. And they went down and they sort of went, got us all lined up and said, oh, one, two, one, two, one, two. We said, what's that for? It says, well, you ones are going to VF1, you twos are going to VF2. And it was that, that way. <laughs> it was exactly that way. So they ended up with Streak pretty much the same uh, same time frame, taking off and landing. But uh, to roll in there with a bunch of JOs uh, with the hand-picked VF-1 at the time. And Streak will talk to you about this. See, these guys were the best of the best of the best. I mean, uh, probably a fourth of the squadron went on to be astronauts. And here I, I showed up and I had to put a, a combined and flight CNF on each hand so I could knew which uh, the hydraulic system I was talking about, you know, so... But it was a lot of fun, and we'll get into that a little later. Over. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll add to that, though, Lur, about getting to uh, hand-pick VF-1. You know, so this, you know, we're obviously nuggets. Matter of fact, I had just made JG, I think, the month of July. So, you know, we're, you know, prime meat, obviously, in terms of going to the squadrons. But 
And Laura, you may recall, I mean, they're, you know, standard fighter squadron in terms of numbers of aircrew, but there were at least 15 or more lieutenant commanders and above in VF-1 at that time. The VF-2 was almost Man, that's the same heavy. composition. Uh, there were four commander streak, if you remember, right? Part, oh, yeah. They, they, they were going through the department. Yeah, heads. there were four commanders. Matter of fact, I come in as a brand new JG. You know, I go into a made-up job, airframes branch officer, and I relieve a lieutenant commander. <laughs> I mean, that's how senior <laughs> the, the uh, makeup of those squadrons were. And, you know, part of that was because they wanted to make sure that very first deployment was a good deployment. But they had stacked those squadrons with all cruise experience folks that most junior air crew was lieutenant. I mean, that's, you know, and, and so we were the first bash, you know, batch of, of no kidding nuggets to come into the squadrons. That must have been quite an experience to be surrounded by that much talent. And just for our listeners who might not be familiar with a, a squadron composition, having four full O5 commanders is double what most squadrons have. <laughs> and having, what'd you say, 15 lieutenant commanders, that's an O4. That's, again, a double or more what a typical squadron has. So two lieutenants. <laughs> two lieutenants. There you go. You say you guys had to at all the all the fun jobs. So that's that's incredible. What a great segue into, you know, thinking back to those days, I was thinking, I bet they stacked those squadrons, which it sounds like they did. And you must have had an incredible experience being surrounded by folks who had so much flight time, so much experience. They probably had some some incredible stories. What was it like? you know, being surrounded by all these guys, you know, you're going off on deployment with guys who probably had Vietnam experience, right? What was that like? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Street. Well, well, yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, to your point, uh, Crunch, that, yeah, they're all experienced, most of Vietnam, uh, uh, most of them Vietnam experience, all F4, F8 background. As a matter of fact, we probably had, uh, you know, I have to count through them. We had four or five F8 drivers in that squadron, and the rest were Phantom drivers. Uh, so they all had great stories to share. They had great lessons in terms of flying, you know, uh, fuel management, et cetera, uh, that, you know, were very applicable, especially because those first two cruises and perhaps the third, I wasn't there for the third, we flew the airplanes clean, you know, no drop tanks. Uh, so, so fuel management was an issue, especially because there are one plus 45 cycles. Uh, so these guys were, were great, you know, you know, fountain of knowledge for, for us sponges that were out there trying to figure out, you know, how, how to be a fleet aviator. Go ahead, Larry. And from a backseat perspective, uh, perspective, these were the guys that designed the AUG-9 and designed the INS. Uh, Dale Gardner, I don't know, he went on to be an astronaut. Uh, I mean, he's sitting down there doing remedial training for me when he says, well, this is how I, I f uh, focus this AUG-9 so it would inc incorporate this. And I'm going, holy mackerel. And these guys were good. They really, really, really taught a lot, taught well. But I'll be honest with you, there was no condescension at all. It was, it was, you're part of the team now. You're part of the Wolf Pack. Let's get going and kick Bullet's ass. Sorry, Bio. <laughs> uh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm used to it. Hey, before we get too far away from it, let's talk about uh, about training command. What was the attitude in the training command? Uh, towards uh, going F-14s. Again, let's start with Streak. Uh, did you, like, were you at the top of your class or near the top of your class coming out of the training command? You know, you know uh, uh, Lur kind of caught it. I, I mean, it was luck of the draw. I mean, I did I did well in the training command. And I'll be honest, you know, I, you know when they first said, hey, you're going to go to VF-124, I said, okay, where's that? <laughs> yeah. and, and what is it? <laughs> you know, because I didn't know. Same uh, story. Um, so, you know, the, the training command, uh, you know, at the time, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Vietnam veterans and all, but a lot of uh, uh, attack guys, light attack guys in there. So they were all kind of pushing that community. Uh, but, but you know, uh, there were a few fighter guys and, uh, you know, and I wanted to go fighters. Uh, but I really want to go in, 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 you know, TAC air, whatever it was, um, and didn't, wasn't a, you know, fighters only kind of guys like, hey, I want to go attack air. So, you know, like Lur, that week that I came up, you know, there was one fighter billet and I just happened to be able to jump into that slot and, and go out to Miramar. So um, it, it's it was it was luck of the draw. I mean, the next week there were no fighter billets. So if I hadn't finished the next week, you know, who knows where I would have gone. So, you know, Amazing. a little bit of luck. 
Yeah, Did I remember. You know, what about the CEO, you? The CEO of 80, 5086, uh, very salty uh, F4 Rio, was back at all kinds of Vietnam time. And he walks in, and he goes, okay, uh, Potler, uh, here's your choices. Uh, F14 uh, uh, West, one seat. Uh, F4 West, uh, three seats. And F4 East, three seats. What do you want? I go, uh, I I think I'll take that F-14 thing. And he looks at me and goes, you dumbass. I mean, you don't know what you're doing. You're going to Fighter Town, USA to fly the F-14. You're a lucky son of a gun. And I, he was right. I didn't know it like streak. I go, okay, which way do I turn out the, at the gate, left or right? Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> well, t tell us about your uh, your final days in uh, VT-86, Larry. You got to, I understand there's a story there. Uh, all right. This is a quick one. Uh <laughs> I was in second place going into my last hop, so I studied real hard. I really wanted to do it right. And and if you uh, if you know about the, the training in the in the uh, uh, Rio, we get in the uh, T thirty nine and we fly in against a T two. You'd come in and you'd pull the forward uh, forward Fox uh, Fox one. Then you do a displacement turn to try to uh, move him out to get a little bit, get displacement, and then you do a counter turn back for your for your Fox uh, Fox two in the rear. So I walk in and I was really nervous about the flight, but really didn't do well. So I come in, took, took the Fox one, started my displacement turn, continued, continued, drop lock. I'm going, I'm screwed. And the pilot who was, who was following my commands, he, he didn't change it because he wanted to rub my nose in it. So he continued, 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 continued. All at once I see a, a contact on my screen I lock him up. We're three quarter mile. I said, "Level the wings, Fox Two, knock it off." That's like what we did in VF One, Lur. Yeah. So I get back, I get back to the uh, to the debrief, and the pilot, the jet guy comes in, and goes, "Okay, Potler, start splaining." And I go, "Well, I had two choices: fess up or butter it up." And being an Iowa boy, you know what I picked. So I, I said, "Well, you know, I stayed up last night. I did the uh, the speed differential. I did the the uh, angle of bank. I did the overtake." And I did the math and it worked. So I thought I'd give it a try today. So he looks at me, five above average is out of seven. And I was off to Miramar. <laughs> they bought I'm sorry, I'm lying, I'm dying. Well, I hope the number two guy in your class doesn't see this. So he... <laughs> well, I told, I told him that night. Pay back as hell. <laughs> oh, wow. What a story. Wait, bye. Sorry about taking up your time. No, you're good, man. You're good. That's a hey, heck of a story. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, to, just to, just to set the foundation for the environment those days, I want to. I was thinking ahead about this, and I'm thinking, what about the threat? What were you guys? Uh, what were you training to? What did you think of as your threat? Mainly the uh, attack air threat, because when the F-14 came in, it was like, a, you know, a whole new generation. And what were you facing? So, uh, yeah. streak. Start with that. Yeah. Please. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think we all go back, if you, if you were honest with yourself, you get back to your first squadron, you're probably not thinking a whole lot about the threat. You're thinking about flying airplanes and having fun and everything else. But as you get ready for deployment, go on deployment. Uh, no doubt. I mean, you're, you're looking at, you know, at that time, you know, post-Vietnam, primary thing was the MiG-21. MiG-23 was was coming out in there, and then the MiG-25 Foxbat. But it's all yeah. Soviet-based threat at the time with their exports and everything else out there. But, you know, post-Vietnam, so things were, you know, there was no war going on, if you will. Things were kind of calm. Um, uh, so so those are the kind of threats we, you know, studied prepping for crews and going on crews. And, and of course, looking at the, uh, you know, the, the threat from Soviet Union with respect to badgers and backfires and da da da, -da all that kind of stuff. But uh, tackier was the mix. I mean, that, that was it, uh, that, uh, you know, the primary amount of time was spent on that stuff. And as far as the uh, long range uh, threat of the uh, vector logic thoughts, yeah, that, that wasn't on our first cruise. Yeah. We were like Street said, we were still doing uh, just air to air, the normal workups, 1v1s, 2v2s, uh, it's all, all dogfighting. And like Streak said, we had no tanks, we were completely clean until uh, we'll get to the point that we started throwing fan, fan blades through the side of the airplane. So then that changed everything. But that, but when we first started out, we were all, uh, all systems go over. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. And that's it, it was, you know, it was clean airplanes. It was air to air. Matter of fact, because, you know, a lot of these F8 and F 
four guys that you know came out. They they were happy to go all air to air because they had enough of their air to mud in the Vietnam era type of thing. Even though the airplane, you know, F eight F fourteen A, you know, had a pretty darn good air to mud system in it. Had a great air to mud ground or uh, gun system in it, um, and and it had all the it had basically the A seven. Uh, air to air to ground ordnance delivery uh, uh, HUD in this country. Yeah, the AUG 15 was still yeah. there. Same yeah. one there. And, was and it, it, it was all there, installed, and, and ready ready to be used. Uh, but part of the reason it was all air to air was that, uh, and, and again, this is folklore, you know, being passed to JG, was that there was no money to fund the air and mud side of the house for the F 14. So that's why the emphasis was all air to air. And of course, you know, that. What the airplane was optimized to do, but it had some great ground capabilities built into it that you know, 20 years later we're going to see utilized. Wow, that's a, that's a great point. So I, when I first started flying the F-14, much later, that it was a thing that we were starting to do, and it was basically brand new. And to think that that capability had been in there with the AUG-15 and the ability to drop bombs that whole time and never used is actually kind of amazing. But um, so thinking about that, so if you're doing all air to air and you do mostly dog fighting, 1v1, 2v2, you weren't doing, uh, you know, chainsaw caps. You weren't looking out there for that Soviet nope. bomber threat at all. No, no. Nope. Go ahead. Wow. I mean, that, that brilliant thinking, you know, Mike, Mike Rio and those guys thought that up later on. And it's brilliant. It was absolutely game changing for us. So the right thing at the right time. But that was about uh, 77, 78 streak, or no, probably early 80s for that. Yeah, no, actually, yeah, Larry, you're right. It was because uh, I went from, I, I uh, finished up VF1 in the uh, beginning of 78 and went to uh, Top Gun as an instructor. And that's where the, the chainsaw, et cetera, started. And that was about the 79 time frame. Mayo can yeah, talk to yeah, that too yeah. when we do it. But, but it really started going in, in 79 and the fleet was working it. So, yeah, for our deployment, 76, 77, yeah, there was no chainsaw or anything else. There, I mean, there was the long range intercepts and go, go, you know, get the bombers far out, but there was no vector logic uh, at, at that time. So, so that's an interesting point then. So, if you weren't doing all this long range cap, but you had just, I mean, we now have the AIM 54 with the AUG 9. I mean, it seems to me like you guys are out there with this brand new toy that can shoot super far, designed for bomb, you know, bear bombers coming over the horizon. What were you doing with it? Were you developing tactics or just going to hit Indian country and seeing whoever was there and fighting? Well, well, I, I, I'll, I'll say I, we really didn't use it like we probably should have up front. You know, it was mostly the MiG, the MiG twenty five was our only real threat we had that, that long range out there. So that that was the biggest biggest uh, thing that we. We're worried about for the F, uh, AIM-54. But the normal, like I say, we went through uh, getting ready for crews, 1v1s, 2v2s, 2v1s. I mean, just working up for dogfighting. That was about our only real real uh, uh, training syllabus for that. Yeah, no, and I agree. I mean, I, I, you know, there, there are obviously folks talking about how to employ the AIM-54, and, and they'd already done the developmental shots, you know, the six airplanes, six weapons, all that kind of stuff. So. So folks are thinking about that and, you know, how to use it against, you know, long range, bear, backfire, et cetera. But it wasn't something we practiced. And obviously any of that practice occurred in the trainers because, you know, that's that's where you're going to do it. Whereas the dog exactly. you did. The other part was, you know, during that time, the airplane, I mean, the challenge in the airplane, once you got off the ground, was great. But getting it off the ground was always a challenge. <laughs> But but there were so many groundings and everything else. There wasn't a, I mean, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of flights. So anytime you could get ACM was was good time because you didn't you didn't fly it all that much. You know, I, um, I go back, I, I think about that, and I remember talking to my contemporaries with flying Phantoms or stuff. You know, in a typical first tour, about a thousand hours. You know, that that, that was pretty typical at the time. You know, for me flying the Turkey, you know, and I was pretty close to the high time guy in the squadron, 700 hours. And that was just a function of the airplane having so many groundings and everything else. You, know, you get, you know, you have a thump, bang, boom. Air for, you know, F-14s are down for two weeks until they figure out what the hell is going on. So we had to kind of live through that in that time frame. As a matter of fact, we had several groundings while we were on deployment, you know, for a week or something. I can't remember exactly, Larry, you may have some, but there were several where 
mishaps back home, whatever, you know, the, the fleet was crowded and you just had to live through it. Wow. Wow. So that's it. That would suck. Grounded for a week. Go ahead, Crunch. No, I was going to say, I mean, it's, it's, it's reminiscent of the, uh, I guess that was the mid nineties. So we would have, I'm going to fast forward because, uh, as an F-14A guy back then, same thing. I was a thousand hour guy as a ju junior officer and my contemporaries in the F-14D kept having a whole bunch of problems, just like you're describing. And they were showing up at Top Gun with 700 hours and having trouble. They didn't have the experience, the flight leadership necessarily to be, uh, you know, accomplished proficient division leads, you know, leading flights of four or strikes or anything like that. That's, that's gotta be difficult when you're a, trying to compete with those F4 guys, you know, as rag instructors or Top Gun instructors where they have that much more experience than you when you show up. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, you, know, it, you know, I wouldn't have traded the experience uh, for anything, yeah. but, <laughs> but um, you, know, you know, 300 less hours of what should have been a normal, you know, first tour. Um, but there were good hours, the ones we did. Um, yeah, and, and once you had the airplane in the air, it was pretty good. <laughs> Getting it off the ground was another fight. <laughs> so, so you talk about that main. So, is it mostly like uh, hydraulic mechanical issues, um, or is it more avionics radar issues? Electric issues primarily, um, and, and I'll go lower to you know remember. I mean, the biggest things um, was water. Even though Miramar is pretty doggone dry. But uh, any type of water intrusion at all. I can remember whenever we had big thunderstorms coming, whatever, you take duct, duct tape and duct tape the panels because you're trying to keep water from getting in on the avionics. Um, so the airplane was pretty leaky for a Navy airplane, you know, and, and uh, didn't do good with a lot of water. But, you know, the challenge was getting it out of line, mostly electrical. I, you know, as a, as a pilot, you got two circuit breaker panels down in the in the uh, leg wells, if you will, just out outboard of your legs. Uh, you know, about fifteen circuit breakers per panel. But I, you, you know, as part of our startup startup procedures, you pull about six of those breakers uh, to make sure that nothing got fried on startup. And then once you're startup and things are running, you pop them back in. And there are a number of things in the back seat they pull too, the same thing. So it was yes. always a challenge to get it out of the line. But once you got out of the line, it worked pretty good. I mean, Larry, you can add to that. Oh, I, uh, absolutely, Streak. So that, that was getting out of the line. Then once you got airborne, the whole different part of the airplane started to scare the hell out of you. So, so <laughs> we'll get to a story there in a minute. But, uh, but uh, Streak, one thing that I never understood, what did the staple do that we put? We, we limited the airplane for about three months for 4Gs only and then put this big metal staple in the bottom of the airplane what did that do yeah it was back that staple was back and it really looked like a a staple and it was about about a foot long and about an inch wide and it was back solid steel just forward of the tail hook uh, attach point uh and it's because they're getting cracking back there so supposedly that would help prevent some of the crack and that's what i remember <laughs> from it yeah 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 that worked out really well yeah. and i remember hearing about that when i was a nugget People were talking about the staple, but I, I didn't I didn't know the whole background. You okay. had to pre fight the staple. You had to hang on to see if you pulled it out. <laughs> That's right. You know, we got yeah. we got plenty of time here. We're gonna get into fun stories and everything, but to, but just to uh, help set the background again, uh some nuts and bolts about uh, carrier ops and, and being on the flight deck and integrating with the air wing. Uh was it a, you guys were out on the second West Coast deployment. Yep. Was it a steep learning curve? Were things figured out by then? Were you still, you know, were people in awe of the Tomcat or, you know, you already told us it was a one plus 45 cycle. So yeah. that's what the whole air wing did. But how about, you know, moving around on the flight? Yeah, stuff like well, that? you know, one thing, yeah, if I recall correctly, um, it was the same exact air wing that went on the second deployment as the first deployment. No, okay. not true, Larry. We had the S3 straight. Oh. Okay, you're right. The S3s were, but, but I, I've met the two A7 squadrons, the A6 squadron. Oh. Um, I'm not sure about the Vigis, uh, but so. Had the Vigis. Yeah, so, so here's, here's, here was the, the air wing composition. Two F14 squadrons, two A7 squadrons, one A6 squadron, uh, a Vigi dead of three airplanes, I think it was. Um, you had the, the, it was, a, and then our deployment was the first S3 deployment. So we had the S3s in there, 
And then once you got in Westpac, you had some EA3s come aboard. I think two of them or three of them. And you had the E2s. And then the E2s, yeah. Um, and then the Helos, obviously. Um, but, you know, minus the debts, you know, the, the A7 squadron, A6 squadron are the same squadron. So they'd already kind of gone through some of the uh, growing pains, if you will, of, you know, stacking the deck, how to stack the deck with the uh, with that composition. That said, uh, and I, I'll get it wrong, but we, we deployed in, in uh, uh, probably with close to 80 airplanes. So what it required, once we got in Westpac, we, uh, there was always a QB debt of about, uh, about 10 airplanes, as I recall, that they just kept there and the, the ship sort of used QB as a, as a home port, if you will, uh, on it. But, but in terms of uh, spotting on the flight deck, in terms of coming out of the stack and where they put the airplanes, uh, that was, you know, fairly good. It was tight, no doubt about that. Um, and then, you know, there's the learning curve of crunches, right? You know, wh wh how the airplanes are spotted. Um, Nothing personal crunch. Yeah. <laughs> Not, no offense taken. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume that wasn't the call sign origination, but who knows? <laughs> um, I, I earned it in the rag and it was well-deserved. <laughs> okay. uh, but, but, and she just... Just to add to that, and and still, they always brought the Tomcats down first. So we we had all the, all the gases still brought us down first. So read your book about your uh, fuel ladder bio. I I wouldn't I didn't know what the hell you were talking about in there. We never had to do a fuel ladder. Oh yes, we did. Oh, man, the guys in the back didn't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. Oh yeah, no, I mean, so it was one plus forty five cycles, which basically meant you're a two point oh, um, and with sixteen k of gas. Typically, you'd launch, you go up and look at the, uh, it, sometimes you had give that was programmed, but you always tried to catch the off-going tanker. And I'd say, you know, 70% of the time, you could probably, you know, get some some gas. Yeah, you know, 1,000, 1,500 pounds max, so you, you net maybe 700, 800 pounds. Um, but that puts you, you know, for one plus 45, that puts you on a ladder that uh, you had to be careful. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't just be moving yeah. the throttles around uh and they come back and i think that's part of the reason why we were at the bottom you know 2k overhead you know we're the first down which is fun because you can hop the deck um uh, but yeah fuel fuel was something we watched closely not like the phantoms had to worry about you know um, yeah. but you, you still you still watched it uh, and the nice thing about the turkey of course you could you could land at a heavier weight than my understanding the F4 uh, could, you know, because we, I think our base weights in the lower was like 42, 43. And at that time, max trap was 51, eight, uh, you know, I think later on it became 54. Um, but, you know, so you could max trap, you know, pretty close to, depending on how much ordinance you're carrying, you know, pretty close to five, five or something like that. So, so you, you had that available there. So, yeah, we watched gas. Not as bad as the F-4s had to do, but you couldn't discard it. I mean, you couldn't be an A-7 and not worry about gas. <laughs> but the cool part, too, and, and I mean, there's no disrespect to anybody else. We were still the, like the prima donnas of the air wing. The, uh, even though the S-3s were out there, you're, you're t for Tom Cat. fighters. You just, you just, Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you know who I am? Okay, well, I'm a fighter yeah. guy. Oh, I mean, let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> when Crunch and I were talking about this, he threw out a term that, that it's something I remember from our my early deployments. And that was uh, Indian country. Did you guys have Indian country? And it, if if you did, you could tell us how it was set up. And if you didn't, I'll tell the audience or Streak, you can tell us because I know we did it later on. So. Yeah, we did it later on. And I'm going to have to kick it over to Lur. I, my, that first deployment, I don't think. I don't recall that we had, you know, no. established Indian country. I mean, we go out and, you know, jump somebody, you know, fellow air wing folks, but I don't think it was standardized like we, like we did later on. At Lerb, do you remember? Yeah, the only thing we could do, I remember a couple of times, Shriek, is they, they'd uh, send you off first, uh, you do you do some turning, and then they recover you at the end of that recovery. Yeah. Oh, yeah, those were awesome. So you could go up and just blow it 
go to go to zone five and leave it there for as long as you need it. To. Yeah. But that's but but, but there's no end in country bio as, as you you can imagine because because the game wasn't there the tank the tankers we couldn't uh, depend on. Yeah. Them. So, well, so for the audience, you're exactly right. We people do, don't know do the jojos every now and then to get it some you know good solid ACM in. But on your typical sortie, you know, if you saved a thousand pounds, you could do a little bit of ACM, but it was mostly a mill because if you tap burner, it'd be gone. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's what I remember too, Larry. So Indian country, if, if anybody doesn't know, is uh, or, or is some, also known as an ACM corridor, and they'd set up a uh, tack in bearing, uh, tack in, you know, um, like from the two four zero to the two six zero radio from uh, twenty to thirty miles or however long it was, forty miles, and if you flew in that area on the way back, you were susceptible to being jumped. So you went there in order to get jumped. Or you hung out on the edge and watched for people to come through and then rolled in on them. And it was awesome. I mean, it was great. Uh, and you'd see A6s, A7s, and other Tomcats uh, going through there, you know, challenging people to jump them or, you know, waiting on the sides. It, it was a lot of fun. But did you have tanks in bio for those? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. But we still, as, as Streak has said, and as any Tomcat guy would tell you, I mean, we still were managing our fuel very carefully, obviously, which, yeah. So that brings up a good point. So let's say you're on deployment or, or even back in the States. So you, you get over there and maybe like you've, um, you know, nowadays, I know that if we get in, in range, like we might set up some dissimilar air combat training with F-15s or some other Air Force unit. Did you guys ever have a chance to do that while you were in back back in those early days and how did it go look at that smile yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely i'm thinking of deployment to lure over australia <laughs> the, the fight to end all fights but to answer your question crunch yeah oh, come on T tell well, us more about the fight that, okay <laughs> so this is um so we own deployment in you know hawaii to uh, i think the first stop was qb after hawaii um and then uh, we end up going down to Hobart, uh, Tasmania, Australia, you know, and supposedly the first aircraft carrier since World War II. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful port call. First ship, first American oh, ship. Okay, since but that's another story. Um, that's another but story. But as we were going down the east coast of Australia, um, oh, God, do you remember the name of the airfield there? I can't think. Uh, no, Mark. Yeah, anyway, you know, north of Sydney, but, you know, a couple hundred miles north of Sydney was a... Uh, Air Force Base, Royal Australian Air Force, F-111s, Hawkers. Um, I can't remember what else they had. They had some other airplanes too. But um, we did this this similar uh, many V. We actually what we did we did an Alpha Strike on their airfield, um, and they defended it. Uh, and it was just a. I mean, you talk about a furball over top of this airfield right on down to the you know hard deck um and it was just classic but you know that's an example anytime we could i, I remember working against the air force in, in uh, clark air force base um so yeah we took every opportunity we could to get some dissimilar uh, uh acm and we did the same thing back in in the u.s i can um you know when we we're working up for deployment and post deployment uh you know uh, trying to get uh F-15s or whoever we could, you know, get for after. Okay, you said it. We broke the seal. Did you fight F-15s? Yeah, I can remember at least once uh, doing a couple times. Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of... Uh... When we ended up to Fallon, we had uh, Muggs McEwen as, as our XO. Then we go, when we went up to, to Fallon, we were going to do uh, our, our debt prior to deployment. So we hooked it up that we were going to do a 2v2 with some Eagles out at Nellis. So we had in, but we brought an EA-6B in 10-mile trail, jamming the shit out of their radar. So we came flying down there, you know. <laughs> they're going, no contact, no contact. We're going, oh, yeah, we got them. Wham, bam, spam, come home. They yelled, scream and cry and whine, and then we were all at the club going, yeah. <laughs> and we kicked their butts, but we brought in the EA-6B behind and didn't tell them. <laughs> True story. Yeah, no. Realistic. I forgot that one. <laughs> um, but back back to deployment, something I don't I think you guys ought to consider. When we were on deployment, there was no wars going on. So we pulled into QB Point twice 
They downloaded all the aircraft, craned them off, or we flew them off. So we flew out of QB Point for almost two weeks out from land-based. And we did that twice during the deployment. Yeah. So, nice. we, so we were all living on the ship for three weeks in QB, flying every day or every other day out of, out of, out of there, going up to Clark and doing low levels around uh, uh, QB. Nobody does that nowadays. I bet by the time the ship got underway, you go, we need to get out of here. I need a break. <laughs> I need to rest up. Well, yeah, as the, uh, the uh, ranch officer, I had to keep going in and bailing my guys out of jail. We had to leave so I could keep my shop together. <laughs> Those were the days. Oh, wow. Holy Again, God. this cruise this cruise guys was just, I think, is nothing like it since. We went to Hawaii, flew for a week in off Hawaii, went on to QB, offloaded, reloaded, went down to Australia, came back up, went in the Indian Ocean, went to Mombasa, went up. Iran was our buddies. We were running intercepts against uh, their fours out of Iran up there. Wow. Okay. Came okay. back down. And then back into QB for another offload, or Singapore, and, and uh, did we stop in Thailand? I don't remember. No, it doesn't no, matter. no Thailand. Then, then back. I mean, it was all eight months, but it was a no no green ink at all. Yeah, no, no, exactly right. We dropped, the only potential green ink was was off Mombasa when uh, Idi Amin, you know, captured the nurses, and so in fact, what happened was we were it was time to come home and then we delayed for like two weeks off of uh, Kenya until yep. until he returned the uh, the you know uh, nurses uh, slash uh, whatever the heck it was um, anyway um, so so what that required is that we came home we we're going to be the first carrier to come home on time in like 10 or 12 years you know think about it you know so we're talking 76 77. All the previous time, they'd all been stuck off of Vietnam. So we came home, I, you know, that's when you, you value the new carrier a lot. We came home at like a 27 knot SOA from the coast of Kenya all the way back to uh, Alameda to make it home on time. Uh, but yeah, but you forgot one other port call there, Karachi, you know, where, where we just dropped a hook, but nobody went ashore. Nobody went ashore. <laughs> They cut the Liberty boats down from 10 to two. Yeah. Never been there. I've been every other place you mentioned. I mean, Streak, we went to uh, Mombasa on the 8182 cruise on uh, Ranger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on uh, Constellation, Constellation. Yeah. In, uh, and the Streak, uh, close to you and I came to combat, if you remember this, we were playing golf and the baboon stole our <laughs> golf balls and we said, I'll let him have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow! Okay, let, let's talk about some airplane problems. Crunch, can I can I open this? Uh, oh discussion yeah, up? please do. Okay, I'm going to give you an easy one first because you know I, I go on social media, internet stuff, and I see people throw out uh, comments about the Tomcat's wing sweep, uh, and and I can only do so much. There you go. That that look of, of consternation tells me everything I need to know. Some people claim the Tomcat was was uh, more was, had maintenance issues because of wing sweep problems. Does that make any sense or recollection? Okay, no, now, not, so let's not get that right off the table. I, I, yeah, I don't remember any issues with the wing sweep. I mean, the only thing were the uh, uh, airbags. Every now and then you'll get ripped, but you just glue them back up again and and yeah. or, and or replace them. But but in terms of the functionality of the wings moving and everything up, no, I don't recall yeah, any issues. Exactly, yeah. I, I, and uh, and so hopefully more people will get the message uh, that wing sweep was not a problem. So let's let's uh, change gears then. How about hydraulics, Street? Yeah, you know, blur. Yeah, I mean there were we're there, getting to the big ones. Yeah, I mean there were hydraulic failures, but I you know I don't think any more so than other airplanes would have um i you know i can't you know i can't remember anything specific that that was a uh, consistent problem with hydraulics you know if anything it was just you know the you know occasional leak slash break in the line but nothing that was you know a, a consistent problem hydraulic wise Lur, you got and the bite eye pump actually worked pretty good. It, it had failures too, but that was a whole new thing. Yeah. Uh, for it. But but the, the joke was, if you ever walk out the airplane and it's there isn't a bucket 
linking hydraulic fluid underneath it, then you're out of hydraulic fluid and you have to fill it back up again. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to see those leaks? Yep. Crunch, what's on your mind about reliability? Well, I was thinking, um, so I remember having the thing that seemed to be recurrent for me was always the AICS programmers, the X programmers that that program the ramps up and down. If everybody remembers those. Because I remember we'd have to cycle those breakers, get that thing started, and you'd always have to, you'd start up the airplane, and the first thing you had to do is you had to manually, I don't even remember how you did it, but you had to run the ramps where you ran them all the way down, all the way up. And I swear that kept me from getting out of the line more than anything else. Um, was that a new? Was that something that was a problem back then? Did you guys ever have problems with the intake ramps on the engines? Not, not consistently. Yeah, I mean, occasionally there were, but I mean, you know, as part of the start list, uh, you know, post start, the ramps got cycled. You know, as as as, as part of that, but uh, nothing that I can recall that was a again a consistent issue. Occasionally, you have some issues. Our biggest electrical issues were with the spoilers the uh with the uh, uh flap slat lockout uh you know a symmetry uh, type of thing and then the gcus generator control units those were the big electrical issues post start that you know made it sometimes tough to get out of line okay so it sounds like the flap slat lockout is something that was consistent throughout but that that had nothing to do with wing sweep just to be clear that was completely having to do with <laughs> Uh, for those who aren't familiar, the listeners, you know, you'd have flaps and slats moving on both sides of the airplane. And if the two, if either side didn't program at the same, oh, there's bio with a model. He's going yeah. to a model. If they don't program at the same rate, it would actually basically cut it out. And so now you couldn't move them backwards. You couldn't move them forward to prevent an asymmetry that was unrecoverable. And so the next thing you know, you'd have this partial flap setting. And if you were coming back aboard the ship with a, basically a no flap airplane, which some of us have had more than once. Um, <laughs> sometimes you would need to have, if I recall, an extra 22 knots across the flight deck. And uh, if if you were fortunate enough to be on the fastest ship in the Navy, the USS Enterprise, I remember we were able to recover in an almost no-win situation. But uh, <laughs> other than that, it was pretty stinking hard to recover aboard the ship sometimes if you were recovering with a no-flap scenario because of a slap, flap slat lockout. But Sounds like that was consistent across the years. Yep, I think that was a uh, an issue with the turkey throughout its life. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay, let's get to the uh, the turd in the punch bowl, the TF thirty. <laughs> so so, street in when you were in the rag. Um, and actually, I'll go back to when I went through the rag in nineteen eighty eighty one. I was there when they prohibited intentional zero airspeed. So before 8081, you were allowed to go to zero airspeed, as I recall. Yeah. And that, I mean, you guys used to do all kinds of stuff like that, right? Well, so, uh, so. Th did they tell you to be careful with the throttles back in those days, or was everything still? Yeah. Go ahead. So, so I'll I'll talk a little bit, and then Laura can talk a little bit about it. But going through the rag, so here we are in the rag in 1970. 475, basically the first six months of 75 when I was there. The rag is relatively new. As a matter of fact, they still hadn't printed the, you know, the blue natops manual, the hard covers. They, they, the blue hard covers had not yet been printed. They were just cardboard covers, you know. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so, you know, things were coming along. At the time, and, and, and I don't know officially what the book said, but the tribal knowledge that got to us, nuggets going through the rag, the airplane was unspinnable, right? You, you could do anything you wanted with this airplane, you know, because it was just so good. And it was true. I, you know, I can remember we used to do a can last ditch guns defense where, you know, the guy would set up behind you, you know, getting approaching guns, you'd be about 250 knots. Uh, and, you know, the standard move was you just wrap the stick in the lap and hit the top, you know, full top rudder, airplane would basically depart over the top and spit the guy out every time. Neutralize, boom, he's right in front of you. Um, you know, think what would have happened if you lost an engine doing that. But there, you know, no issues with that. It was unspinnable time. Now, engine-wise, yeah, you still had to be careful about the throttles. You know, you didn't want to be doing that and cycling the throttles at the same time. They either needed to be in, you know, burner or a mill 
you weren't cycling. So, so you always had to watch out for, for the engine side of the house. But, um, you know, again, tribal knowledge, you could do anything you want with the airplane. That changed over, you know, the next year or so when we started losing some airplanes. Uh, but, you know, that initial time in, in 75, you know, and probably through the end of 75, quote, the airplane was unspinnable and you could do anything you wanted to do with it. And again, that's probably more tribal knowledge than what was written in the book. But I don't remember seeing anything in the book. You had obviously well, spin recovery procedures, but, uh, you know, go ahead. Sorry. The streak, uh, even one of our syllabus hops in the rag was to take the airplane, oh, yeah. take it up the mock, put it on end, take it up to 80,000 feet. Of course, you're not touching the throttles and you're you actually, you look at it's 60, maybe 70, but you're seeing the black, you're seeing the curvature of the earth. And then it just, you let it fall off and it fell right back down. That was one of our hops. Yeah. And you did, Amazing. you know, as, as the pilot, your first, your first sortie in the airplane was with the pilot in the back. And maybe your second one, or I, I think that was it. There may have been one other sortie when you went up with the pilot in the back when you did zero airspeed recoveries, right? Where, you know, part of, you know, and maybe it was just prior to doing the ACM syllabus, where you went out and you took the airplane intentionally at zero airspeed and watched it recover, you know? And that was to give you the confidence that, yeah, the airplane would recover from zero airspeed. I don't think I ever got to 80,000 feet, Larry. That might be a slight exaggeration. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, we did that. All right, so that's a great question. So what's the highest everybody's ever been? Laura, you you claim 80,000 feet, which I think makes you an astronaut. Congratulations. No, in all seriousness. Thank you very much. <laughs> in all seriousness, how, how high do you Have you been up to 80,000, Laura? Have you been up to 80K? Nah, I'm oh. lying. I'd be amazed. <laughs> how high do you think? How do you remember? How high have you been? Oh, we, we went up through 65. I mean, we, they were 250, but they're, you're not moving the throttles. But the thing's going just, you can do that. If you if you don't touch the throttles, anything under 50. Yeah, Streak, how about you? What's highest you ever were? Yeah, probably closer to, to 50. I mean, as you, as you got up there to, to uh, you know, the high 40s, the airplane, you just it would barely hang in the air. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so yeah, I think I, I, you know, kissed 50 once or something, but, uh, but this was a, this is zoom in those yeah, isn't yeah, straight. Yeah. I, I didn't do one of those. <laughs> so let, let's keep it on the, uh, the engine problems. Uh, Lur, I understand you were uh, flying on a, uh, sortie one time and a, uh, you, you were involved in, in watching a guy lose his engine or something like that. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was uh, 75 getting ready for cruise. Uh, it was again a, it was a 2v1 uh, against a Top Gun F5F. Uh, Rich read it, Turtle read it, and Jack Entz were in the F. And uh, Cleck Irvin, Bear, and C Steve Saban Sabu was in uh, the, our wingman's jet. And then uh, I was flying with Mike Norman. Went out on the normal uh, 2v1 where we set up. F5F's coming through. He passes right between us. Um, we had we were actually the wingman, so we had started our, our lead turn into it. So then we were we were got pretty good angles on him. So I'm going up. So I look back over my shoulder to pick up Bear, and all at once this huge fireball comes boom right out of the back of his right engine. Sort of couldn't tell his right engine out of the back of it. And then all at once Bear's going, knock it off, knock it off. I got I got a fire. I've got a fire. I'm taking it north. So we quick uh, I went I went on uh, guard called emergency, then called the, uh, uh, the uh, North Island and had him, had him launch the, uh, the halo heading down because we joined on his right wing. We were off about a mile, a little, little above, and the airplane was burning on the right side. It was really smoke was coming out pretty bad. Uh, so we were down about, uh, we were in Papa 1 or Papa 2. We were about 65 miles down, coming through, coming north. All at once, she's going, oh, okay, I'm losing it, I'm losing it. Stand by, stand by. And then all at once, boom, the canopy goes off. Both guys go out. And we're we're going, wow, you know, that's something to see right off your left engine. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't seen that one before. Uh, but, yeah, he, he had caught fire and he, he put, hit his firelight, but it, it was still continued to burn. Must have been the residual around the side. But anyway, so we saw both guys go out and I looked up, saw one good shoot. So then I looked back and there was a streamer. Guy's going straight down. You see at the bottom of it, the guy's arms, swinging his arms, trying to open his risers, like working his, his bejesus off. We were at 13,000 feet. 
he kept falling and falling and falling and falling. So we watched him all the way down, 60 seconds fall. And then he goes down through the 2,000-foot cloud layer. So we're going, wow, okay. So, you know, normal procedures are with the F5, since he's lower on gas, he stays high for calm. And then Led and I, Mike Norman and I, would go, went down to try and spot the, uh, spot the, uh, the RAS. So anyway, we circled down and, and Bear, we, we didn't know it was the, the pilot, but he was still floating down in a chute. So we went, we went on down, went down through the 2000 foot scud layer. Uh, actually it was pretty calm that day. So we went down and, and saw the, uh, saw the uh, raft floating on the water. So we got pretty slow and I said, uh, you know, it's, watch your, watch your stall speed, which we stalled about twice. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he did good. Uh, so we flew over the raft once, just saw the thing floating on the water, flew over the raft twice, and the third time turned, and there Saban was laying over his raft, and he waved his arm at us as we went over. God. So he After had 13,000 feet, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, you know, let me finish the story, and I'll go back to the analyst, analyst afterwards. So we went down there. We went off to the side because Bear went through. They launched the Hilo. The Hilo came down and picked them both up. Boom. Back in Miramar, we were back within an hour. Uh, what had happened, they don't know why, but his, his uh, raft, when, he, when it came down, wrapped around his, uh, his risers so he couldn't get an open chute. So he said as he was falling, he went down, falling, falling, he did everything he could, and he said, well, you know, this is it, going through the cloud cover. Well, the risers kept him vertical. If he would have hit in the analysis anything different like this, it would have, you know, done bad stuff to him. But he hit and he said, I was dark, it was dark, it was cold, and then I was up under the air. So that's what happened. And they did a study at his terminal velocity was 126 miles an hour. They did a whole study on that. So if you ever want to know what the terminal velocity of a human falling from 13,000 feet is, it's 126 miles an hour. So 30 days convalescent leave and he was back flying again. So, so let me, but oh, go ahead. After that, there wasn't any flight that he wasn't like this on, and you can't blame him a bit. So, okay, Street. I'll, I'll add to that. I'll add two parts to that. The first part was that day, you know, and I, as I said earlier, it was hard to get ACM sortie just, just because of the, you know, aircraft availability, et cetera. I was supposed to be on the schedule that day. And that was my airplane. Bear stole that. <laughs> Bear stole that airplane from me that day. Bear's a great guy, you know. And, but I was mad. I mean, man, I mean, you know, ACM. Huh? So that was the airplane I was going to be in. Instead, I got a chance—not a chance. I was given an airplane to take up to Point Magoo uh, because they did like a sibling up there. I don't, I don't know what they were doing, but I mean, they tore airplanes apart. So I, all I did was ferry an airplane up to Point Magoo. But as I'm in the landing pattern. Boom, I heard things go off on guard, etc. I didn't know it was our jet yet, but I knew an airplane was down. Land, blah, blah, blah. get up, you know, call back That's to amazing. base to say, hey, I'm safe up here. Oh, yeah, that was our jet. It was Bear. <laughs> Holy cow. So I was still mad at Bear, but not quite as bad mad after that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add, then, oh, go ahead, Streaky Dunn. The other part of that is what, and, oh. and Laura, you, you have more of the details probably than I did, but I thought, I thought the story was Sabu was going down trying to open his risers, what didn't work. And he's going, well, hell. And so he finally, as he's approaching the scud layer underneath, he popped his life raft just because, you know, I rock, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and, the, and the raft popped and went above him, circling over his head. And that actually slowed him down a little bit. And that was one of the reasons yeah. to help him survive when he hit the water. Break, break. Second part of the story. So this happened. I don't know, two months or so, or, or two and a half months prior to deployment. We go on deployment. We're a month or so in deployment. We're in the middle of the Pacific, blue water ups, no diverts. I'm up there with the same Rio in the back seat. We're about 200 miles out from the boat. And would you believe it? What do I get? Fire warning light. Um, you know, it, it, now, because of the, all the engine problems, et cetera, you, you always treated fire warning lights like the real thing. But there was also an issue where Sometimes the light would just start to flicker on and very dim, and then it would start getting brighter and brighter, da, da, da. And that was just a, you know, a bad system. Uh, so anyhow, this fire light comes on. I look at it, no secondary indications, et cetera. Start turning to the, back towards the boat from a couple hundred miles. And then it was very careful because I knew there'd be some excitement in the backseat. I said, uh, we got a little bit of- Wait a minute, did you even tell them? Yeah, 
I said, we got, a little, <laughs> we got a little, the master caution went off. Yeah, we got a little bit of an issue here. We got a, a, a fire warning. Away. <laughs> as you can, you know, as anybody would react. I mean, here he is three months away from, you know, just about buying it till we got a fire warning light. So that's just- but that but that that plane that we lost uh, in Southern California was one of the first times of that. So they really wanted to get the bottom of it. So yeah. luckily we we marked the lat long uh, of where the crash was. So came back and I gave them the the coordinates. They launched a recovery effort down there and they got the uh, I don't know how deep the water was, but they wow. went down and found the airplane and brought it up. And that was one of the first indications that they were throwing the fan blades. Yeah, well, wow. they, uh, cool. you know, uh, they'd lost an airplane on the prior cruise, thump bang. Uh, so yeah, that that that's uh, that's true. They needed to get the airplane back. I think you know, memory if memory serves, there was also an issue because we lost not the F one, the F two, but the F fourteen community lost a couple airplanes in uh, at Miramar in the landing pattern, mm-hmm. and you know where there was an issue with the back seat. Uh, sometimes the risers get entangled up because, uh, yeah, God, I can't remember. I think it was VF2, an airplane where Rio just got a partial shoot and broke his back, et cetera, but survived. Um, um, you know, so that there, there was an issue there too with the, with the seat, the back seat in particular with, uh, with that, that they figured out you know, shortly thereafter. So if I could, so you were talking about, um, this is when that's the inst- that mishap where you discovered that we were throwing fan blades. Uh, talk me through that. So for the those, I mean, I that was before my time when the TF-30 was having issues, you know, throwing, throwing blades. Talk, for all the listeners, what did they find? What was going on with the engines that was, would, I mean, were they just microscopic cracks that were breaking and kicking out compressor blades? What was going on? Yeah, it was mostly compressor blades. Uh, I think it was more function of FOD ingestion than it was manufacturing defect in blades. I, you know, to be honest, I don't recall exactly, but FOD was a big issue. You know, we had, used to have to inspect the airplanes because all the fasteners and if anything came loose had to be marked, you know, as missing. So you wouldn't think it went down the duct. Diving, you know, the, the uh, plane captains dive in the ducts all the time you know to make sure there's nothing on the uh, in there but i think it was more fod associated you know engine issues than it was mm-hmm. ma- pure manufacturing you know the tf-30 was not a good engine you know i got 3200 hours in the turkey flying all tf-30s but um it was it was just it was one of those issues where I think in the early days it was more about ingesting FOD, maybe self-induced FOD from the from the panels forward that you know caused some of those issues. I don't know. what do you remember? No, that's pretty much it too, Streak. Yeah. Okay, I gotta go. Okay, so you know it, it I like that story because the guys survived, okay? Yeah. And it was it had to be cool to see all that stuff. But but I want to get back to some cool Tomcat stories like we were talking about earlier. And and let's go back to the TF-30. I mean, the TF-30 is, you know, the whipping boy for the F-14A. But when when it was new, when you guys were flying slick Tomcats without Phoenix rails, probably, was the TF-30 good, you know, streak? Do you remember yeah. as a fighter pilot yeah, no. thinking that you had – you never have enough power, but it was, you know – wasn't it, it, wasn't it a settle? I mean, it was an F-111 engine originally, and we just settled on that because of, of money. They, that was not – the original first choice, no. right? Sure, but but in terms of now you're in the fleet and you're flying it, yeah. was it was it good enough? Yeah, I mean, obviously it was adequate because we had it all those years. But you know, to Lur's point, it was supposed to only be like the first thirty aircraft for TF thirties, and after that, it's supposed right. to, it was supposed to be another engine. But um, uh, you know, matter of fact, I picked up a couple birds at Beth Page, you know, to, to bring back out to Miramar, you know, brand new airplanes. Um, and of course, once you got them out there, they had to go through acceptance inspections, et cetera. But those engines were uh, tuned pretty high. I mean, they airplane in slick airplanes. No, no, uh, you know, they had a stub rail station one and eight, just a stub for where the rails would attach. And you took those airplanes out on your PMCS, and the engines weren't detuned yet. It would go fast, quick. Then shortly, exactly. shortly after that, they, they detuned the engines down so they weren't quite as uh, as uh, good. Um, but but yeah, other than you know the fact that you know engines would stall, da, 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 
you know, you, you had to be careful. You could, like a fighter guy wants to be able to move the throttles whenever he wants to move the throttles. I mean, that's the way it should be. But you had to be very cognizant of that in the F-14 and, and, you know, be careful of where you were when you decided to move the throttles, right? Um, Having said that, Bio, I couldn't agree with you more. When they threw those that zone that into zone five, you were going for a ride. That was that's, that cool. was that's the way it cool. should be. I mean, you know, all, all the enthusiast books give the original uh, uh, TF thirty thrust of you know twenty thousand pounds per engine, but the NATOP says it was detuned, like Streak just said, to seventeen thousand pounds per engine. Yeah, and that's you know that's a pretty big hit. Yeah. But, yeah. But but you guys flew some of the early clean airplanes that had to be that had to be cool. I mean, I talked to a Grumman engineer who said that in their first uh, tests or calculations or something, they showed the F-14A accelerating in the vertical and they were going, man, this thing's going to be a rocket ship. And I'm going, well, you know, it didn't wasn't quite like that in the fleet. But well, the, the, B and the, the B and the D got closer to that. Right. But the A was supposed to. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, okay, so um uh let's let's get back out on uh, deployment. Did you guys oh crunch, I cut you off, buddy. Let no, me ask please, one quick. Go ahead. Did you guys uh did you guys stand alerts? Did you have any uh, bears come out and <laughs> look at you? Yeah, no, all right, good. We're in a good one. Because if well, they both laugh. Basically, once you got west of Hawaii, you were in alert status for the rest of deployment until you got east of Hawaii. You know, there was a line out there that they did it. So, so yeah, I mean, you were alert 5, alert 15 for, you know, most of the deployment. But anytime, see any anytime bears? you weren't doing fly ops. Yeah. Did the, oh, did yeah. The, yeah, we did uh, – uh, Rich Conwell and I launched and went up and joined a couple of bears and and uh, I took off my helmet and put on my gorilla mask and then lowered my seat and then raised it up real slow up in the side and there you could see those little the Russians in the back bubble they were all taking pictures of a, the guy the gorilla in the back of the F fourteen that's pretty funny yeah yeah no you know, I bet the, those pictures are online now uh, might be yeah. You know, the, the bears, you know, the bears would come out. So, yeah, we, we, we did intercepts, you know, fairly regularly. Yeah, you were, you were still new airplanes. They probably wanted to see what it was all They about. were. I mean, we st almost the whole time we were uh, uh, that side of the uh, the uh, dateline, we were, uh, they stood alerts. I mean, we were just like, like you guys did too, but it, it was, uh, but mostly uh, 15s. What, what was yeah, your, we were, uh, what was your weapons posture? What, or I'm sorry, your weapons load out when you're standing alert like that? Oh, I, I I think it was a, I think what one one and one wasn't it straight? Yeah, it was at least that. I was going to say it was two winders, at least one sparrow, and then um, occasionally a phoenix, but not that often. Phoenix, I, but we did we carried phoenix because they wanted to get cap to carry time on them, and you know, you know yeah. So so we carried phoenix too. Yeah. Oh, you, so you did have phoenix rails on? Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. On deployment. Uh, one of the two front stations in the tunnel there, three and four, whatever, those those had the Phoenix uh, fairings in there. I mean, that was normal by the time I got into the fleet. I was I was hoping you guys may have lived without it for a little while, but I guess not. No. So. But we didn't have drop tanks. <laughs> but you didn't have what tanks? Drop tanks. Oh, yep, yep. I know, nice. Well, you had a max trap of 51.8, so you, you kind of had to limit the amount of stuff you were carrying, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, not really. I mean, because you think about it, everybody's mentality was, you know, F four mentality. Which, and again, I didn't fly it, but you know, those guys were used to coming back at night and only getting two passes in there, you know, before they had to tank. So, so you know, there wasn't you know that big a concern, I guess. Hmm. Makes sense. Okay, well, I'm going to ask another one. When you guys, when you guys were back in uh, Conus or fighting uh, Air Force or other guys, did uh, were they impressed by your shiny new F-14s, or were they like, "Yeah, we can still kick your ass," you know, fighter pilot trash talk? Um, yeah, no, I, I you know, the F-15s, F-14s, you know, we did. I mean, of course, yeah, everybody's going to say, "No, my plane's better than yours," but I, I think they were. Uh, they 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 were they they were impressed with the capabilities that were there, and recognizing like F fifteen for example that we were very very similar in terms of capabilities right what the aircraft could do. 
And if I remember right, Streak, and correct me, I mean, you were down downstairs and I was upstairs on most of my jobs, but when we got back, the, the parts uh, supply was all focused off us. And so we didn't do a whole lot of flying after that first cruise. I mean, it was pretty, pretty sparse. Yeah, no, you're right. Oh, I mean, so they, that, that's typically they were supporting today. like the other squadrons. Yeah. I mean, that's when uh, they'd shift out to 32 and 14 and 32 would, was next to go. And, and uh, there weren't a whole lot of spare parts back then or airplanes to rob them off of. Yeah. No, no, no that's exactly right. When we got back from deployment, you know, like they do today, you know, there's a stand down time. And then you're the you're the you're the last in line for parts, right? Until you start getting closer to your uh, deployment date. So yeah, we went through that. Except when we got back, the the only person that got to fly was uh, the crew that was picked to go to Top Gun. Uh, let's see, who was that, Marty? Um, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, well, I do. <laughs> yeah, but. And for, for your listeners, it was Marty Chanick and Al Krause. <laughs> you would come in there. Maybe, I, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I was scheduled for a hop, and, and you guys would strut in and go, uh, they'd look at you and go, oh, sorry, no airplane today. And they go, yeah, well, we'll take this one. <laughs> Boom. Lur, go back up and put your clothes back on. <laughs> Somebody oh, had to do it, Lur. Come on. <laughs> That's right. So for the for the listeners and folks who don't know, back to, uh, things are a little done a little differently now. But back then, you uh, would have been in the fleet for maybe a year and a half or so in your first fleet squadron. And then the CO would have said, hey, you two lucky sons of gun are going to – you get your dream shot. You're going to Top Gun. And so you get a whole bunch of workup flights, and then you go down to Miramar. In your case, just the next hangar over. And you go through, I think it was probably a six-week course back then, doing one V1, two, five-week course, excuse me. Yep. And so you go through the course, and then the idea was that you would come back to that same fleet squadron and share that knowledge with everybody else. Is that a, that a fair assessment? Yes, it is. That's on the mark. It, there were five long, week, five long weeks, by the way. Five long <laughs> weeks of awesome flying is what it sounds like. Because uh, <laughs> things are done a little bit differently now. We'll talk about that some someday in the future. But um, just, you know, the, it's that whole the rich get richer thing where, hey, if you get picked for it, you just keep getting the flight time and getting the flight time. And then you get to go get that dream shot and go uh, go get the shot at it, which was awesome. And then, you know, in some cases – uh, like obviously streaking your your co- choice uh, your uh, situation, you did well, and they they look at the folks going through the class, and sometimes they reach out and they say, "Hey, streak, we'd love to have you come join the squadron and go be an instructor at Top Gun." What do you say? And you know that you had that opportunity. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, once again, right place, right time. So, uh, and and of course, at that time, there weren't you know Top Gun didn't have that many F fourteen experienced folks in the squadron. You know the Hawk Monroe Smith, I think, was there, and they had uh, Smiles Bucky, and maybe one other person, you know, who was F fourteen experience. So, so again, right place, right time. You know, I got a chance to go and spend three years there. Great flying. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the funny, and then of course, when you're where you're sitting there as a an instructor at Top Gun, you got the F fourteen A, which you're now flying, but you're probably flying some other airplanes as well, right? Oh, uh, as an instructor? As an instructor. Yeah, yeah we no. fast forward about three, four years now. Yeah, yeah no. What else are you the, flying? Yeah, the, uh, the F5 and the A4. The F5 and the A4. Okay. Yeah. So now the question, of course, is, hey, here you are. You're an F-14 pilot. You're going fast. You're going to 80,000 feet with Lure. And you're, and you're also flying the A-4, the scooter. Well, uh, some of us think it's like the best airplane ever. And the F-5, the little rock, lawn dart. It, what's what's your comparison? You got a chance to fly a whole bunch of different airplanes at the highest level of air to air combat. What do you think of the how's the Tomcat compare? Yeah, well, you know that's not a, a simple answer. Uh, F five and the A four were just a joy to fly in pure ACM. If I was going into combat, I wouldn't want to be in an F five or an A four. I don't. <laughs> I'd want to be in an F fourteen. Uh, you know, so, you, so, you know, you, you got to put those two, if you're out there sport flying, if you will, you know, uh, A4, F5, a lot of fun. Uh, but in terms of combat capability, obviously the F14 and, and the F18 when I flew that later on too. Yeah. You, you can say it, Marty, those airplanes didn't have reels in it and the F14 did. <laughs> Go ahead. You can say it. And, and, less and, we don't know it. And they had 300 we pounds of gas more. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh wow, that's funny. it's hard, Bio. It's hard. 
<laughs> you're holding up well. So yeah. okay, so you're all let's we're, well. Uh, so you're in you're in your uh, that VF one. You got to the end. You know when you showed up, there were you know seventeen lieutenant commanders and all the O fives and Miramar hanging out in the squadron. By the time you left, I'm betting is probably back down to normal squadron size. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. now you guys are the old hats, right? You're the you're strutting around. You know, streaks growing his mustache in and looking cool and hanging out at the club on Fridays, right? And how was it when you're 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 sitting there and you see these new, new guys coming in? You know, what's that like? What what are you saying to these guys? You're like, hey, I've been there, done that, or you know, let me. I mean, what what was it like when you're seeing those new guys? Were like, wow, holy cow, these two guys they were here in the very beginning and now I'm showing up. What's that like? Yeah, I, I think like any squadron. I mean, you're there to pass on your knowledge. And, and of course, we're not very far apart. I mean, hell, I was still a JG as those guys were coming in. You know, I didn't, you know, I didn't make lieutenant till six months before I left the squadron. Um, so, you know, you're, you're kind of all the same and you're passing along what you know, trying to, to uh, uh, you know, get them up to speed because you're, you're now the section leads, division leads, all that kind of stuff. So you're, you're doing the normal pass down. Laura, you're going to say something. But a lot of the transition stuff, too, is different than it is today. They were transitioning squadrons, not just people. Right. So when we went through, you know, the 211, 24, all those guys would transition to the squadron. And most of all those guys had Vietnam time. So there there weren't, weren't a lot of uh, folks with water behind their ears in those early transitions. Because they once like we were the first. And then over the next five years, they transitioned, what? Another twenty squadrons yeah. to the Turkey, so yeah. so it was a, it was a different time. Yeah, because I think the last trend, I think the last Phantom squadrons, ooh, I want to say late eighties, uh, you know, mid eighties to late eighties, something like that. Twenty one and one fifty four. Were they the last two? Yeah, because I remember right around the mid eighties. I think yeah. yeah. We stole their F four S's after, but that's another story. <laughs> three one three two. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, I mean, Streak, I met you 40 years ago in VF24 and Lur, you know, probably a few months later or something like that. You must be old, Lur. <laughs> I am. I'm getting old, <laughs> luckily, thankfully. Uh, but, I mean, thinking back on those years, we could have never imagined we'd be sitting here doing this right now. So this is probably something that'll be cut out by the video guy. Cause he'll go bio. What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> but I had to throw that out there. Waxing reminiscent or whatever they say. There you are. Yeah. 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 Mm, funny stuff. Crunch. What else you got? Anything? Well, I'll tell you what, man, I've, I've gone through a, a whole bunch of the ideas that I wanted to touch, touch on. I know there were quite a few things that, um, that I, I was like, hey, I need to make sure that we talk about this. And holy cow, you two guys just like went all the way down. You, It was like you had our playlist and you just kept talking about everything that I'm like, we need to make sure we talk about alert posture. Boom, there it is. So you guys, uh, I, I really enjoyed this and I certainly learned something. Um, I, I, this was okay. What did we? Fun. What did we not ask you that you wanted us to ask or what mm. are you dying to tell? Anything? Uh, I mean, it. it uh, O Club stories, amazing Tomcat stories, something you did that you now can reveal. What do you got? Anything? Well, from those early days, I just they're all just sweet, sweet memories, you guys. I mean, and uh, Streak will be the same. We we were best friends in the squadron, still best friends. Uh, the experiences we had, I looking through my logbook and all the Channing Channing Potler uh, team ups were there, and remember every one of them and. And anyway, just over to you there, Streak. You're a, you're a good man, and I was proud to know you. Yeah, well, the same, Lur. I'll tell you what, there were a lot of, uh, you know, good memories. I mean, first squadrons, I think, are good memories. But, you know, we we got to see and do a lot with them. Uh, you know, to, to answer your question, by you know, it's – you need to feed us beers, and we could talk for hours and hours probably, and things would start coming out. <laughs> but um, – um, Or do we make it up? Yeah, really, or make it up. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, th I think we kind of hit the high points of what it was like in those early days. Um, you know, it was a, it was a real pleasure to watch the airplane mature over the years. You know, when I, uh, was XOCO VF 84, uh, for desert storm, those were the best, uh, maintained, uh, F-14s I'd seen in, in a career. And, and it's, you know, it's a tribute to all the troops and everything else that, 
you know, when we flew airplanes in Desert Storm, you know, the entire systems worked and they were consistently up. That's not true back in those VF-1 days, and, but that was the airplane, you know, going through its birthing pains and growing and, you know, the community supporting it and all those maintainers to, to where by the time you get to mid 80s, you know, it, uh, you could depend on, you know, all the systems being there, the raw gear working, da 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 da, and what raw gear, yeah, that's, you know, short point there. But, anyway, <laughs> um, but, you know, by the time we got to the late 80s and 90s, it was, it was uh, just, a, you know, an airplane that was all there like it should have been from day one in terms of uh, systems working and capabilities. That's Good wrap up. That's great. Crunch, you going to close us out here? Well, I tell you what, I think that is what we allotted for time today. So I really appreciate it, gentlemen. This has been uh, an incredible, incredible series of stories. And I bet that after we hang up, we'll be like, oh, we got two more. And I would love to, you know, maybe we'll have a little redux later where we come on and we hit, we just have story time over a couple beers and, and maybe call it a hap internet happy hour and, and air that later. All right. So if we come up with some more stories, let's let's come back and tell them. That'd be fun. We can do the tail look. <laughs> Or we could do. Yeah, I got my shirt on. I got my tail look shirt on, so we're good. I want to say, all, all you listeners out there, uh, buy Bio's new book, uh, Top Gun Rio, and you can relive every second of this. So get out there and then stores and buy his book. Thanks, Lur. Nice plug. I'll send your check. Hey, that's it for this episode. Join us again in two weeks when we'll be talking about the Og Nine. All right, we'll see you then. <laughs>